What I love about DevOps is it's all about outcomes. Welcome to Architecting the Cloud, part of the OnCloud podcast, where we get real about cloud technology, what works, what doesn't, and why. Now, here's your host, Mike Cavus. Welcome to Deloitte's Architecting the Cloud podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavus, and I am here with friend and colleague, Michelle Shuttleworth, Managing Director, who is part of the Deloitte Consulting Delivery Innovation Group. Wow, that's a lot. What does that innovation group do? Tell us about what you do and, and, and what that delivery innovation group does. Oh, thanks, Mike. Great to be here today. Delivery innovation is all about transforming delivery. I know we'll jump into this because it's something I can't help myself by saying in any conversation, but it is really about delivering differently. How do we, how do we in the tech space drive efficiency and quality? Uh, my focus is largely on how Deloitte delivers our services, but we know that that ends up um, as we engage with our clients on how they deliver as well long after we're gone. Um, what this means is we work on the delivery approach. It's uh, working across the agile spectrum, the application of modern delivery techniques, everything from agile, design thinking, lean, automation, shift left testing, and my favorite, DevOps. What I tell a lot of folks is deliveries change more in the last five years than it has in the previous 25, and that's the 25 that I've been around this space. Um, and it's certainly become a lot more fun, um, a lot more value forward, just a, a just a more interesting place to be now that we're looking at how we deliver and, and delivering differently. The technology is changing so fast, and at the same time, the, the process in which we deliver software is changing just as fast. So it's a pretty exciting time to be alive. It's also confusing and hard and challenging. So you talk about DevOps. It's one of both of our passions. You do a lot of work in that space. I have clients come up to me and say, we already do Agile. Why do I need DevOps? Or what's the difference between Agile and DevOps? So what's your answer to that question? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good place to start. Um, when Agile came out in 2001, it was all about delivering value fast. And I think a lot of people have looked at that and, and, and made it what they would like it to be, which is delivering fast or being able to change anything whenever I want to, less discipline, all the things that we hear in the noise around Agile. But Agile really is um, not only delivering value fast, but it's an empirical way of working. And when you slow down for a minute and you think to yourself, what does empirical really mean? And what does it mean that I have to do? If, in other words, if I'm saying I'm doing Agile or I'm being Agile or this work has been delivered in an agile way. What do I mean? And it has a lot to do with learning as you go. So it's not just a matter of, hey, by the way, here's your due date. Here's the 3,500 requirements that I want you to meet. Go. Are you ready? Yeah, that's that's not agile at all. Um, but the difference between agile and DevOps, uh, DevOps as we describe it within Deloitte, is delivering value fast with stability and quality. I think the two play very well together. What I love about DevOps is it's all about outcomes. And I think when teams start to get their minds around what does it mean um, to either apply Agile or DevOps or both in concert, it really is a complete mindset shift. Um, and I think the number one mindset shift is it's let's focus on what the outcomes are and let's make sure um, that, that we are structuring our work in such a way that we can get to those outcomes. And equally important, are you stopping? Are you observing? Are you learning? And then are you doing something different with that knowledge you've gained? Or are you just pushing that same noodle uphill just faster and harder, which is what we see a lot of? Yeah, and I have a slide. I did a presentation the other day internally for Deloitte. Uh, the topic was DevSecOps, but I, I kind of did the intro of how did we get here? Mm -hmm. And it talked about, you know, the history of DevOps and, you know, the continuous shift left. And um, one of the images I had in there, it went from waterfall to agile to DevOps. And really the only difference in the picture between agile and DevOps is, you know, you had these circles of iteration, but at the end there was a wall and you still threw it over to ops. And then the DevOps one, you had those circles, but you had run underneath it, right? So it was, yeah. it was deliver and run is to collectively, collaboratively together. And that was kind of the, the difference there. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. It's so funny that the phrase can be DevOps, and yet most people are not looking at the second part of the phrase, which is ops. And what does it mean when I actually get this into production? So as you've described, either, hey, I threw it over the wall. I'm hoping like hell it's someone else's problem, not mine anymore. Um, or, um, no, wait, that's, that's, that's ops and I'm not doing that. 
So we, we see um, a lot of teams focus on parts of DevOps, that's been my observation, without encompassing the full, the, the full intent um, and the outcomes, when I said to you the definition that, that, that we believe in is delivering value fast with stability and quality, means that you actually have to be thinking not just about what am I trying to build, but what's going to happen when this is live. Um, everything from what's the total cost of ownership, what's the workflow that it's going to take to continue to build and evolve on this platform, if it is a platform, um, what's it going to, who's going to, whose phone's going to ring at three o'clock in the morning and why? And what all of that thinking does for you is it really does drive a different way of working. That's where, the, to me, the DevOps mindset and the principles really come into play. And folks, some, and I realize folks listening, some will have, there'll be varying degrees of experience with DevOps. But what we so often talk about is shifting left. Um, and you, you brought up that this was in, in a DevSecOps presentation. Uh, if I think back five years ago, and painfully, in fact, and still in some, some uh, implementations I look at, you get to two weeks before go live, and then along comes a cyber team. And it's like, well, let's, let's see if this meets, <laughs> meets the cyber rules. And in today's world, you can't. You've got to be thinking earlier, bringing all of that in earlier. So you're thinking about how you're going to operate the solution, thinking about ops the entire time that it's been building. It's not two separate, unrelated activities. Yeah, and shift left and system thinking are two buzzwords we're hearing a lot of. And, and basically what I always talk to the developers, engineers, is you have to design for ops, right? Ops is not an afterthought anymore. And it requires a shift in the way your product owner thinks. Now, the product owner now owns all the illities, right? They don't no longer are just the owner of features. So I'm going to tie it back. You just did a big uh, session on system thinking. So why? what is system thinking and why is that important as we're starting to deliver so much more frequently and so much faster with le- with more automation and less people to inspect? Yeah, I, I'm going to keep the, the definition side fairly simple and rather you know describe and talk about what does that really mean. So it is taking a much more holistic perspective. You know, I watch teams um, start maybe with a technology first, okay, I've got my features and I'm running and I'm building. But to your point um, about the illities, the product owner doesn't just own the features. They own the outcome that this product is intended to deliver. So whether this is a payroll system or whether it is your shopping cart experience for a website for for, uh, end u- for um, uh, you know customers in the market, you can't just think about the features and the, and the widgets, et cetera. What we've done within my team, um, because we own a number of products, is our team's been thinking much more about where and how their time is being spent. And we look at about a 60-40 split in terms of you can't spend all your time just building um, new features after features, you are responsible for what that user experience is like. What downtime are they seeing? Um, what are the biggest pain points that they're experiencing? Where do we need to build automation in so that they never have to ask for something? And it really shifts how you, as a product owner, you prioritize work. If this entire baby is yours, even at 3 a.m. in the morning, it's amazing how the roadmap changes and how things like I don't care about cyber until two weeks before it becomes a very different problem because you have to answer the question, what happens if there is a breach? What happens if you're on the front page of the paper? And if that's part of your responsibility as well, you're responsible for this baby, you know, all the way through college and beyond because they don't ever go away. You prioritize work differently and you think holistically, which is what system thinking is looking for. Yeah, and I'm going to date myself with this famous quote, but we always used to say the best developer is the one that carries the pager, right? Yep. <laughs> What's a pager? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's that thing you used to go to that other strange thing, the uh, payphone, and call people from. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't worry. My car, I can still physically wind down windows, um, both my husband and I, and I can tell you that those are vintage without even intending to be. Most kids don't know where the phrase wind down the window came from. <laughs> then come to my house and I'll show them. <laughs> We've seen a lot, huh? Um, yeah. <laughs> So, um, you know, a lot of clients, as they try to embrace DevOps, their, their first question is almost always, where do I start, right? So what is your advice for those leaders who are trying to bring this change, this DevOps mindset in their organization? First, where do they start and what, what kind of pointers would you give these people? 
Yeah, I think it's important um, to recognize that there there is no um, single playbook. And a lot of people will bring you their version of here's here's how you're going to be successful, or here's the the, the approach. And the, what what I think was really important, and I think about my own experience here, is as a leader, which was what was your question. Leaders have to examine their own thought processes first. They need to be answering the question, um, and I'm going to keep beating this drum, what outcomes are you seeking? You need to make sure that you and your team share the same outcomes. Um, and as a leader, you need you need to ask yourself, how am I going to be working differently? You know, my personal experience, and it's about five, it's probably going on six years now, where I was looking at my own team and going, why am I not getting different results? Why do they keep giving me the same results? What I recognized is I was asking for different results, but I wasn't willing myself to stop asking them for things that I used to ask them for, to let them work differently, to encourage them and to challenge them and to prioritize differently. And that was a big mental shift for me. And I see it in clients as well. Everybody wants agile and they want DevOps. But what's interesting is, have you stopped and asked yourself, what does that mean I have to do differently? And that's a very good place to start. And if people are saying, well, that's great, but I think I'm doing everything, I would say, if you think you're doing everything you should be doing differently, start by talking to someone else who's, who is already successful in this place and start to challenge your own ideas of what working differently looks like. So start with yourself as a good place, my, my piece of advice. Yeah, so the next question kind of fits into that uh, about thinking differently and working differently and the system thinking part is a lot of times people don't have a view of the entire end-to-end process. They only understand their piece of the process. And a lot of times DevOps to, to people is writing scripts and automating. But if you're automating old, stale processes, you're just automating waste. So some of the things we do at Deloitte, and I think you have a lot of experiences as well, is, is getting them to all the right players in the room and doing value stream mapping and, and inspecting those processes and optimizing those processes. So talk about why value stream mapping or practices like that are, are important and the importance of really taking a step back and looking at the end-to-end processes. I'm process-minded. Um, you know, when I started my career, I was on the functional side and designing processes that came out of the HR side of the world, the talent side. So for me, this is a a no-brainer. When we talk about agility, delivering value fast, it's absolutely pointless unless you're going to examine waste. If you only look at how do I do new shiny things and deliver bright outcomes, but you haven't stepped back, looked at the big picture and said, where is it that I have waste? And waste comes from um, handoffs and it comes from uh, wait times. The only way you can examine that is is the holistic system thinking, step back and say, let me look at the value stream. That means that teams have first got to understand what their value streams are, because there might be more than one, or maybe there's a macro one, and then there's a couple of others that that roll up into it. Um, This obviously comes out of the manufacturing world. What's fun for me is I'm married to an engineer that works in, uh, a chemical engineer that works in the manufacturing world. So my husband's home office has um, maps of of manufacturing of mills and all sorts of waste and handoffs. So the first thing is, you know, recognize that there's value in identifying waste. To identify waste, you have to draw out, first identify what your value streams are, then draw them out and actually ask yourself, what is it, what is, what are all the steps? And I know that's laid out really nicely in the in the Phoenix project. It's a great story to read. It's even better when teams do it for themselves. The other couple of things around value stream management and why the holistic approach, I believe, is so important is that when we get to automation, as you'd mentioned, that's where a lot of people go. If we are um, automating exactly the same process we have today, we may not be optimizing. Um, What we have to do is think about, firstly, how do we optimize flow? So it's all about working, you know, being able to optimize flow through the process. And that, that and it means that you shouldn't be automating only silos or parts, and you shouldn't be automating on top of what may be a broken process. So that's why I think value stream management, value value stream mapping first, and then managing that value stream is very, very powerful for people who really believe in what DevOps is all about, which is changing your outcomes. Yeah, and one thing that's hard about it is the value stream usually spans multiple organizations. So a lot of the processes that are in place are from organizations trying to build workarounds from the handoffs from the other organizations. Yep. So what, what you get is like local optimization, but the whole value stream becomes a lot of unnecessary steps. So 
how this is the million dollar question, right? If we could crack this nut, we'd probably be rich, but how, <laughs> how do you do this when there's like in a lot of examples, there's a VP of each group and none of them want to change behavior or none of them want to give up control. That's really the hardest part. It's one thing to assess that value stream, but it's another thing to get different groups who aren't aligned to change. Yeah. So a couple of things that I would give advice um, or if I was, when I am in these shoes and I look at um, the craziness, I was watching on a flight recently, I was watching one of these shows, uh, sports shows, and it was talking about Wayne, Wayne, Wayne Gretzky when he was a kid. Mark, I don't know if you know this. He used to sit when he was watching a hockey game, I think about the age of seven, and he would literally draw everywhere that puck went on the ice. So I the, saw that too. Wasn't that West. awesome? I saw that a few weeks ago. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> pretty awesome. So the first thing I find is is hold up the mirror. So in order to drive change, people really need to, number one, see that there is a need. I know this sounds like real basic stuff, but draw the puck on the ice and show people what it looks like. And, and then you've got to make sure that people are centered around what outcome are we are we seeking and can we get people to rally around it? Because every time... You have a different organization, you have a silo, and a silo is then breaking up your ability to be effective. So I think it's, to me, it's hold up the mirror, it's get the right people at the organization to agree at the outcomes, and then start small. Change is very difficult. Now, you know, having, you know, living this myself, and then also guiding and advising others, I feel like it's so easy that this can just get really wrapped up and very difficult. So try and find one area where you think you can get people on board because the outcome is so important and prove success and then go from there. I think a lot of teams will end up looking at how they're organizing. I don't know that I would how they're organized. I don't know that I'd always start there because then people get very enamored with the activity of reorganizing and they forget about the outcomes and then instead new silos get drawn. And certainly what we've done um, in, in my team is focus on becoming a product-based organization. That really helped us break a lot of walls down, you know, deliver value a lot faster. And that entire mindset, you know, so marrying um, product mindset along with DevOps, agile and design thinking has made a real difference to the value and the sort of engagement that we've been able to drive. So, but it all starts with stare at the crazy first <laughs> before you can uh, map that path to change. We Throwing around a lot of buzzwords here, and when you add it all up, it's it's a lot of change. It's a lot of new concepts. Or I wouldn't say new concepts. Or everything's an evolution of something else, but we're kind of emerging thinking, I would say. And then the next challenge, it comes down to skills. Do people have the skills? And uh, just a few weeks ago, I interviewed Jane Grohl, who works for DevOps Institute, and they just published this Enterprise DevOps Skills Report, and it was all about upskilling and, and training and skills. And I, I was like a week short of that being released when I was interviewing her. I'm like, dang, I wish I could have waited a week. But I got you on. So that's that's good. And uh, you've looked at that report. And what are some of the key nuggets coming out of that report? And what's the skills challenge we're facing? And how do we how do we deal with it? The upskilling report by DevOps Institute is, I would say, is a, is a must read. You know, I believe in the power of the team. I don't think anything happens without people. Um, and with my background and talent, obviously, I'm very thoughtful about skills. There were a couple of things that really stood out to me. Uh, it was one of the Gartner uh, references that they had that, that I wanted to headline this with, which is 70% of the people in technology have not mastered the skills they need today. And when you stop and you digest that, you, can rec you recognize how powerful and important it is to be focusing and thinking about the skills that we have. A couple, a couple of things that, that I thought were good, were, when they, they spoke about the must-have skills, this is using the language from the, the, uh, the report, the top three were automation, process, and soft skill. That really resonated with the experiences that I have had, you know, but I think it also marries in with the way that you've been thinking around approaching this from, system, well, from a systems thinking perspective along with value stream management, because if you, and mapping, if you can't first think about what's that overall process before you start automating, and you don't have people in your team uh, with automation experience, you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of misguided automations. But I like the way they put soft skills in there as well, because of all the change aspects that you were talking about, the ability to influence, to explain, to lead, 
um, to challenge, to motivate. A couple of other things that I, I observed uh, that I think is, is worth pointing out, and it goes along with a lot of the Deloitte research um, that Catherine Bannister has done around our own tech fluency program, both you know internal to Deloitte and externally as well, is around T-shaped skills. And meaning that, yes, everybody does have depth in something, but you really need to have that broader perspective. So the T on the skills is being able to know your adjacencies, those things to the left and the right. Um, when I look at my own team and what I think they have done so incredibly well is they have learned how to learn. And we have, we've encouraged experimentation. And as a result, there's been good learnings and very quickly applying those learnings. The one thing that troubled me a little bit about the report, and hey, it's only the data. It's not uh, not something that um, I think the DevOps Institute is saying, but but when only 20, it was 18% of the respondents felt that they would hire and train people internally, I feel they might be missing out on something because what we've done is used our own team, you know, given them the space and the breadth to, to learn how to learn and to experiment and to apply. And it's just been you know, fantastic to watch the results that have come from that. So because it's so hard to hire, and because these are new skills and there's a broad range in them, I, I would really be encouraging people to ask, what is it that I can do internally to create this culture of learning? Because like you said, Mike, there's a lot of these different techniques and, and changes, not only in technology, but in delivery. The more we can teach our teams how to learn and apply those learnings, the better the results are going to be. Yeah, and as I walk into a lot of organizations, you know, some are high performing, some are low performing. Even in the low performing, they're they're loaded with brilliant people, and I, I sum that up as the technology is easy, but people are hard, right? So these people can solve any technology problem, but it's the the flow and the organizational silos and the processes; those are the things that that stifle innovation and delivery. That's my that's my new quote. You know, technology is easy, people are hard. <laughs> yeah, no, we've definitely seen that. Some of the things you spoke about innovation, some of the things that we've been working on to really um, get the results out of innovation and, and to, to help people learn how to innovate and how do you deal with things like the silos. We've um, Maybe it's a conversation for another day, but we pulled together an I3 framework that works through ideation, incubation and, and industrializing and trying to get people to figure out how do I take a good idea um, and get it, get it worked through fast? Because the worst thing that could happen is to feel that, you know, for people to become complacent and feel that they can't take advantage of this awesome technology and all of these learnings that we have in this industry, um, you've got to be able to give people the ability to break through and get the results that they're trying to get. Yeah, great, great talk today, Michelle. Appreciate your time. Two things. First, where can we find you on Twitter? I'll let you answer that. Yep, at MP Shuttleworth. And second, on top of all these wonderful things we just talked about that you do, you also kind of lead our organization and help us sponsor some events and some white papers. So talk about some of the upcoming things that we're a sponsor of and, and what can you expect to see us out there in the field? Yeah, absolutely. We'll be looking forward to seeing folks at the DevOps Enterprise Summit in Vegas, October 28th to the 30th. And we're working with the amazing Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Google Cloud on the 2019 State of DevOps report. So, Mark, one of the things I'd do is um, let's do a plug for that survey. Um, being able to get great information across to the Dora and Google Cloud team is incredibly important. So, please take part in that survey. Um, and yep, we look forward to, I guess, seeing folks out on the conference circuit and the different podcasts because there's uh, the more we can learn and share from each other, the better. Well, that's our show for today. You can find more podcasts like this from me and my colleague Dave Wintercom just by searching for Deloitte on Cloud Podcasts. We'll see you next time on Architecting the Cloud. Thank you for listening to Architecting the Cloud, part of the On Cloud Podcast with Mike Cavus. Connect with Mike on Twitter, LinkedIn, and visit the Deloitte OnCloud blog at Deloitte.com forward slash US forward slash Deloitte dash on dash cloud dash blog. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. <laughs>